Hey there, I'm Pastor Darrell. Welcome to Mount Moriah. To some of the ladies here this morning, I say happy Mother's Day. And then, of course, we still got the men, and that day's coming. Um, but today, we're, we're supposed to be focused on our mamas, right? Um, so, welcome. We're going to jump right into Scripture this morning. Um, just as normal, I usually don't put together specifically a Mother's Day uh, sermon or message. But what I absolutely love uh, about God's Word is God's Word teaches us how to live our lives. God's Word teaches us how to love one another. Uh, and those are things that we can, we can use uh, when we're thinking about our moms, when we're thinking of any of the relationships we're in. Uh, so uh, what we learn here today, might be you might be able to take that home and be a better son or daughter. Um, you might be able to honor your mom and dad uh, in a better way. So we're going to go uh, to John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. And while you're flipping through those pages, I want to thank Ford Campbell again for coming and bringing uh, us God's word last week, faithful to scripture. And that, that is exactly what we're here at Mount Moriah. What we're here for is to, to learn about the Bible, to learn about what God really truly has to say. And uh, I'm always appreciative for all of those who, who fill this pulpit uh, those who've come before me, those who will, will be after me, those who, who fill the pulpit off and on when I'm not here, uh, the faithfulness to God's word is the most important thing. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to do that here this morning as well. That's how we honor God. So John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. John chapter 10 is a really interesting book of the Bible. Uh, it talks all about shepherds. And so we're not real familiar nowadays with shepherds. Uh, we don't, uh, I don't know of any of us that are raised sheep. I know we've got uh, a couple pig, uh, people that raise pigs. We've got some people that raise cattle and things like that. Um, I, when I was very, very young, we had a few sheep, so I still don't know a whole lot about shepherding. Uh, but one of the, the things in this passage especially is, is we begin to see the role uh, that our true shepherd, uh, the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, plays and and has uh, in, in the lives of the Jewish people back in, in biblical uh, days, uh, but as well uh, what we can learn about it today. So if you go back, we're not going to cover the first few verses. We're actually going to jump in at 22, and we're going to see how Jesus kind of wraps this up for a few of us. He says, Then the festival of ded dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Jesus was walking in the temple complex in Solomon's colonnade. And then the Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, just tell us plainly. Jesus says, I did tell you, and you don't believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. The father and I are one. So we look at this passage, and there are just uh, a few questions. If you're following along uh, online with, with our sermon of the day or sermon notes for this week, uh, the first question that I see in here is, who is this Messiah that they're waiting for or, or talking about? And so you look in your passages, uh, the way you've looked up in your scripture, I could hear the pages turning. I love it. Um, in your translation, what you're reading, it probably says Christ. There's only a few translations that actually use the word Messiah. So the Christ and Messiah, it's not that our translations are calling Jesus something different. Christ and Messiah both simply mean anointed. Um, and so when we go back and look into the Old Testament, what exactly is this Messiah and, and who were these people waiting for? And when we, before we get to that, I want us to see that this is not a friendly conversation. Um, this is a conversation where the Jews, and it's not just the Jewish religious leaders like we often talk about, but it is anyone who was around when Jesus was at the temple this day. Now, it's the beginning of the celebration uh, of uh, the, the festival of um, the dedication, which uh, the reason why I was confused is it's actually they're celebrating Hanukkah. 
Okay, so what happened is, is in, in the early uh, 163 BC, I believe, uh, the temple was, uh, was overtaken or, or actually reclaimed uh, from a leader who had overtaken the temple in 168 BC. So they're celebrating this festival of lights or, or whatever you want to call it. They're celebrating this as the temple has been rededicated to the Lord. So it's an important moment, and we see Jesus celebrating or being in the temple during some of these festivals and during some of these times of remembrance. And so he's walking through. And the reason why they believe he's in the colonnade, and I wanted to make sure of this before, because um, when we celebrate Hanukkah and things here, it's in the winter and it's cold. And most scholars believe that it was probably that way when Jesus was there as well. So the colonnade is a place uh, where they believe it was part of uh, still remains of Solomon's old temple. And so they would, when they would walk through, it would keep the weather off of them. There was actually a place where they would walk through, and so it was a little bit more protected. Now, in your passage, it says they surrounded, and this isn't just kind of like, oh, they gathered around him and said, oh, we'd like to hear what Jesus has to say today. They're actually surrounding him like you would expect nowadays. It's a mob. Um, they see Jesus and they've become impatient. This is actually the last time Jesus is going to publicly speak to, to a crowd. And, and so they've come and when it says they surrounded him, it would be like, uh, not like you guys surrounding me on the way out, hopefully. Um, but uh, it would be them just angrily grouping around Jesus and saying, hey, Jesus, what's up with this? You know, we want to know plainly. We, we, we kind of get what you're doing out there. We kind of see what you're saying out there. But we want to know plainly what's happening because the Messiah was a big deal. Back in prophecy, if we look back, there's two ideas that, that really go from vaguely being described in Scripture when we look at Genesis. And then as Scripture continues and as history continues, we see a, a greater picture of what this Messiah would look like. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we just simply see once Adam and Eve have sinned, God explaining to them that I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your heel and or he will strike your head and you will uh, crush his. He will strike your heel and he will crush your head. Um, so we see that God has promised, and what we would understand here isn't necessarily the Messiah, so to speak, but we see that God is going to provide a Redeemer. Now, as we go through Scripture, we see that that Redeemer is going to turn into one that is the Anointed One, the Christ, or the Messiah. So when we get into Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, we see the Messiah described somewhat as a strong leader, a ruler, or even a king. Uh, so in Genesis chapter 49, we see him described like this. The scepter will not depart from Judah or the staff from between his feet until he whose right it is comes and it, the obedience of the peoples belongs to him. Psalmist explains it a little bit more in Psalm chapter 2 verses 7 through 9 and says this. I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with an iron scepter, and you will shatter them like pottery. So this idea of Messiah, what, what the Jews at this point, uh, when Jesus has come on the scene, some of them have the idea that Jesus is going to be a ruler or a leader. Now, some of them believe it may be something as simple as Moses, who will just uh, be able to, to bring, rally up the troops uh, and get the, the Jews together and lead them uh, as Moses did. Some believe that it might be a, a military leader as uh, during the time of Maccabees, all of these uh, ideas and all of these pictures are, are, are what this strong leadership would look like. But then we go a little bit further into prophecy and we see this. Isaiah describes him, the Messiah, the Christ, as being a suffering servant. So the two ideas is first of this great ruler, and now all of a sudden there, there seems to be a picture in Scripture uh, of a servant that, that is going to somehow be this anointed one. In Isaiah chapter 53, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture, it describes him like this. Who has believed what we've heard? 
And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by men. A man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from and he was despised and, he didn't, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, he carried our pains, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. When we see these two pictures, when we see these two ideas of a Messiah, which one would you prefer? I mean, I want us to to put this into the perspectives. Why are the Jews so interested in this? Because there are two drastically different ideas of what the Messiah is going to look like. And up until this point in history, they don't have a, a really good idea that there may be two opportunities for the Messiah to come. You see, scriptures haven't, in the prophecy of the Old Testament, they haven't described it in such a way that that this might be two times for one leader. But what their people are sometimes questioning here is, might there be two messiahs? Will there be two separate messiahs? Will God send a, a ruler and then send a peaceful leader? Or is it going to be at the same time? Or is one mistaken? So the Jews were concerned about Jesus because they didn't see the one that we would prefer. I mean, if America, we were looking for a strong leader, what do we, what do we look for? We look, uh, we look for someone who who can take command of a situation. We look for someone who's extremely wise, extremely strong, extremely politically strong, extremely militarily smart or, 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 or or able to put that, put together great strategies and, uh, and and lead the, the country. Or would we prefer someone who is meek and mild and, you know, would, would almost appear to be pushed around and, and begin to lose power? And, and so we can see why the Jews may have been getting a little bit impatient. The ones who are looking forward to this ruler are, are like, Jesus, are you finally going to step up and, and be who we want you to be? And you notice it's who they want him to be? Or Jesus, are you just going to keep doing what you're doing? And should we look for another? Should we anticipate someone else? So if you're the Messiah, we just simply want you to tell us. And I love this, and I'm paraphrasing here. Jesus said, seriously? And it has to be a paraphrase because that's kind of the way I see it. Jesus is is like, seriously? Have you not been paying attention at all to what's been going on around us? So that first question, what are they looking for in the Messiah? What are we, what are we seeing? Jesus says, I've already shown him to you. I've already made myself evident to you. And you guys don't see it. You're not able to understand it. So we have to ask ourselves the second question. How had Jesus already revealed himself as the Messiah? So to the Jews who have questioned Jesus over and over and over again, Jesus simply says to them, I've already, says to them, I've already demonstrated to you or I have, my actions have been a testimony as to what God has done through me. So what he's saying is, is if you don't have anything else to look at, he tells the Jews, look at my miracles. Look at how I have distributed or exhibited the power of God. In John chapter 5, verse 36, he says, But I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. You're looking for the anointed one who God has sent. You're looking for this Christ, this Messiah. I'm telling you, everything you see me do is proving to you, is showing to you that I'm the one that Jesus has sent. He showed that to the Jews. He showed that to to those in Galilee. He showed those, those things to the Samaritans. He has shown and demonstrated God's power from the beginning of his ministry to the end. 
And he said he would even do greater things. He would accomplish greater things than John. John never did miracles. John just simply called for them to be baptized, called for them to be repentant. So John was preaching the message, but Jesus came and demonstrated the power that God had given to him. When we look at John the baptizer, when he wasn't sure whether or not the Messiah was who he was, uh, he sent his disciples and said, I want you to go and, and talk to Jesus. And when you go and talk to Jesus, I want you to ask him if he's the one that God has sent or should we be waiting on another? We find that passage in Matthew chapter 11, verse 26. And this is what is going down. John is in prison. And, and so this is what happens. When John heard in prison that the Christ was, or what Christ was doing, he sent him message through his disciples and asked him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied to them, I want you to go and report to John what you hear and what you see. And this is what he refers to. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Those with leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised and the poor are told the good news. That's all referring back to to prophecy that the Jews uh, should have been aware of. And then in verse 6, he says, And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. So when you see all the things I've done, when you hear all the words I've preached, if you're not offended, if that is sounding like it makes sense, then guess what? It should. So he tells John the Baptist, it's all good. I'm here. I'm the one that God has sent, and and, and you don't have to look for another. We see that. Are are those just isolated incidents? Well, not really, because there are actually three more incidents that I absolutely love. They're my favorite portions of Scripture where Jesus just comes straight out and tells everyone through different people and through different experiences that he is the Messiah. There's no question. In John chapter 4, verses 25 through 26, again, and one of my favorite stories, the woman at the well. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. That can't be any more plain. That can't be any more simple. She says, hey, when the Messiah gets here, the one that they're going to call the Christ, when he gets here, then then he's going to explain all this to me. And Jesus said, guess what? Your wait's over. Here I am. That gets simple. Uh, There's no question. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 17, we see one of Jesus' disciples who who he calls to come alongside of him. He says, but you asked them. Uh, But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father in heaven. So when Peter says, you're the Messiah, Jesus doesn't say, well, Peter, good for you. Good try. Uh, It was a nice guess. Uh, But he just simply comes out and says, you're blessed because the father's revealed this to you. And basically what he's saying is, Peter, what you've just said is absolutely true. It's absolutely true. I'm him. And and there's going, there's not going to be any other. Uh, And then so we get to the, the, another one where Jesus is uh, in the temple and he's teaching. And this is early on in his ministry. Uh, And and I call this the mic drop because that's kind of popular with my son and and some other people, uh, other kids that age. But this is the mic drop that just explains it all to me. Jesus gets up into the temple. He is invited or allowed, however you want to see it. He's invited or allowed to actually read scripture. Now, when he reads scripture, that is given to the rabbis. So what they would do is they would read the scripture, and then they would sit down, and then they would explain the scripture to them. And some of these people, they would sit down, and they would explain these long oratory things where you know they preached even longer than I do. And they would just keep on explaining and explaining and explaining, and people would fall asleep, and people would, you know, they'd be a little bit of drool hanging out of their mouth, you know, all these different things. 
things happening. So this is what Jesus does. It says that he's uh, reading the scripture and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me. And this is found in Isaiah chapter 61, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, to the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And and I want you to think back. What What did we tell uh, John the Baptist, what did he say? A lot of the same things, right? Uh, he was going to be healing. He was going to be proclaiming the good news to the poor. And so that's exactly what Isaiah is saying here. Jesus reads it. He says he rolls up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And everybody's like, oh, this is where it gets good. He's going to explain this to us now because we, we don't quite understand. And, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, it says. And then in verse 21, he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. That's it. If the Jews, if the people were waiting for any other sign, this passage alone should be enough to where people who had heard Jesus, people who had seen Jesus, people that were there at the synagogue when Jesus was reading this, they should have just looked at him and said, Messiah, Lord. And that should have been the end of it. There shouldn't have been any more questions where we have to surround Jesus and say, would you please Please just keep, keep, what is this? Uh, You just keep uh, keeping all these secrets from us. You're just not telling us. Why don't you just come out and say it plainly? Jesus is like, seriously? Where have you been? What have you been listening to? So what is it? Question number three, what is it? What kept them from being able to recognize him? And Jesus in this passage today, again, explains it simply. There is a bit of a mystery surrounding this idea of being his sheep and not being his sheep. But Jesus just simply says it simply. I did tell you and you didn't believe. The works that I did in my father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because why? Because you're not my sheep. Now that's kind of harsh. Because in the whole beginning of the chapter 10, Jesus is explaining who the shepherd is and who the false shepherds or or, or who the hired hands are. And and he's explaining to them uh, what the sheep, the benefit that the sheep receive from from the shepherd. And and now all of a sudden, uh, as they've surrounded him and said, okay, we've just heard all this stuff, but who are you? And Jesus says, you don't know who I am because you don't belong to me. That's the simple That's the simple answer. But is there more? Is there something better to that? Is there something greater to that? And and the answer is yes, because it explains through chapter 10 who these uh, sheep are and who these sheep aren't. And it goes throughout Scripture. So is the mystery surrounding it? Basically, uh, we're just going to call it out and say what it is. People believe uh, that God has elected some, chosen some uh, to be his sheep and, and some not to be. Uh, and I don't believe that's the case. I believe that God wants all to be saved. I, want, I believe that God wants all of the people that he's created to be his sheep. I believe we see that throughout Scripture. And if, if you've got a question about it, just simply go back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. It doesn't say that for God so loved some of the people that he created that he sent his son. But he loved the entire world. So I believe uh, it, it is an idea that God loves us all. God has somewhat chosen or, or or given the opportunity for each of us to to hear the good news and respond to the good news. But Jesus says, some of you just simply aren't going to hear it. And this is what the explanation might be. Warren Wearsby explains it quickly and precisely. And he says this, from the human standpoint, we become his sheep by believing. So from the human standpoint, the way we become sheep is by believing. But from the divine standpoint, this is from God's viewpoint, we believe because we are his sheep. So there's this mystery here that cannot, we cannot fathom or explain, but we can accept it and rejoice in it. God has his sheep and he knows who they are. They will hear his voice and they will respond. The lost sinner who hears God's word knows nothing about divine election. He hears only that Christ died for the sins of the world and that he may receive the gift of eternal life by trusting the Savior. You hear that? That's the good news. He hears only that Christ died for the sins of the world and that he may receive the gift of eternal life by trusting the Savior. When he trusts the Savior, he becomes a member of God's family and a sheep in the flock. 
Then he learns that he was chosen. I like that explanation. It's not that God didn't choose him in the beginning because it says that, 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 that God chose us from, from the beginning of the world, from the before creation. And so we see in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, what does that look like? Well, from our perspective, once before we're saved, we are looking at it from a human perspective. From the time we are saved, we look back and see that God chose me and may revealed himself to me. In him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, he also learns that each saved sinner is the Father's gift to his Son. So when Jesus is talking about his sheep belonging to him, when he talks about these sheep that hear his voice, when he talks about these people who who have responded to the good news that Jesus, the Messiah, has preached, he's talking about people that have already been given to Christ by God. And I'm here to tell you that if you hear his voice, you are a child who's been given to God. You're a child who's been given to God. In the Bible, divine election and human responsibility are perfectly balanced. In scholarship, we have no clue what either one truly means. It's one of those great mysteries in Scripture that none of us will understand, but the great thing about it is we don't have to completely understand it to be able to take advantage of it. It's like turning on a light switch. I've got friends who are electricians, and they tell me how all that's supposed to work. My wife works for a power plant, and she tries to explain to me how all that stuff works. And you know what? I have no clue, but I am so thankful when I walk up to that light switch and I flip it, the light comes on, that is amazing to me. And that's kind of the way my relationship with Christ is. Do I have a better understanding of how that light switch works now than I did the day that I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Yes. But what did I understand the day that I first turned that light switch on? That Jesus Christ loved me enough. God loved me enough to send his one and only son. That if I believe in him, I should not perish, but have everlasting life. I don't understand exactly how that light switch worked, but when I turned it on, I realized I was chosen. I was chosen. And from that day forward, I was God's sheep. I belonged to the shepherd. That's as simple as it gets. So how can we identify Jesus' sheep? And this is for uh, not, I, I don't want this for us to look out and say, well, I wonder if Bob's one of Jesus' sheep. I wonder if Lori's one of Jesus' sheep. I wonder if Joyce is one of Jesus' sheep. That's not where I want us to go with this. I want us to, to internalize this and examine our own lives. I want us to hear it from our own personal perspective. Uh, so are we with one of those sheep? Well, John 10 tells us that here's the three characteristics that we have to understand. Did we hear his voice? Can you hear his voice? Now, as a 12, 11, 12-year-old 12 boy, I didn't hear an audible voice say, Daryl, receive me as your Lord and Savior. I didn't hear that. Uh, some people have said that they did, and that's great. If you did, that, that's, um, actually, that's kind of amazing. And uh, I'd like to say I'm jealous, but, you know, uh, I'm not. Uh, but did you hear his voice? When someone explained the gospel to you, did it begin to make sense? Because if it began to make sense, that means you're beginning to hear You're beginning to hear the shepherd. The second thing is, are you known by him? Well, the whole cool thing about this is, is when someone begins to speak to you, how do you know they're speaking to you? Well, first they may call you by name. That's, that's the first one, right? How about eye contact? How about inflection of the voice? How how about just the simple communication itself? You know, have you ever been the only one in the room? Somebody comes in and, and, you know, we all watch that movie uh, where the guy's looking into the mirror and he goes, are you looking at me? Are you, well, you you must be looking at me. I'm the only one here. Uh, And sometimes that's how the experience of God is. We begin to hear this voice and we begin to know that he knows you simply because he's telling you things about yourself that nobody else knew. Nobody else knew. You begin to feel conviction about your sin. You know, that's God saying, I know who you are. And you're saying, you know what? I don't want God to know who I am or what I've done. Well, guess what? He knows anyways. But the great thing about Scripture and the great thing about God is he knows who you are and he still loves you. He still loves you. 
How do we know? Because it tells us in Scripture that he sent his son while you were still a sinner, while you were still doing those things that you didn't want anybody else to know about. God knew you, and he sent his son, Jesus Christ. He sent the Messiah to die for your sin, even the ones that nobody else knows about, even the things that nobody else knows. You're known by him, and you can hear his voice. And then the third is this, that you follow him. You hear his voice, you understand that he knows you, and you decide to follow him. Um, I've been watching Chosen, uh, the Chosen, uh, the, the series that everybody's talking about, and, and the, I just absolutely love it that Jesus just comes up straightforward to each and every one of them, and all he says is something as simple as this, follow me, follow me. Well, and we just learned about Nicodemus a little bit today. And Nicodemus in the show says, you know, well, where are we going to go? What, do I, what am I giving up? What am I going to experience? And Jesus doesn't give him all the details. He just says, follow me. And if you talk to someone who is one of God's sheep, you'll find out that following Jesus is the greatest thing that you can do. It's the greatest experience that you can ever have. First John chapter 4, verses 3 through 6 explains it a little bit like this. There's some things in here that we can pull from it. But every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. So if you don't understand who Jesus is and, and you're not able to confess him as your Lord and Savior, then that spirit, uh, you're not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. Even now it is already in the world. So this idea of anti-Jesus, anti God. It's already existent in the world, and I think we see evidence of it every day. In verse 4 of 1 John chapter 4, it says, You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and anyone who knows God listens to him uh, and listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. Do we confess Jesus? Is Jesus the way we get to heaven? Is Jesus the way that we have a relationship with the Father? And according to Scripture, is Jesus the only way? Because that's what Scripture teaches. That's what the Bible teaches, that there's no other way. There, there, we're not going to get to the end, and, and there's not going to be exceptions made. We're not going to get to the end, and, and they're going to say, okay, well, you believe this because you believed it sincerely. You come on in. Well, you didn't believe anything because you didn't know any better. You come on in. No, the only way Scripture teaches us, the only way to come to the Father is through Jesus Christ. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And this tells us in First John, if if you're not confessing Jesus, then you're not one of God's sheep. Some people belong to God. Some people belong to the world. But what I'm here to tell you this morning is even if you belong to the world right now, he knows you. He's calling you by name, and you can follow him. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? God knows you. He's calling you by name, and you can follow him if you hear his voice. So who gives them eternal life? The next question, it's the shepherd. How do we know uh, or how do we understand the shepherd able to give life? In John chapter 10, 10 through 11, it says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. So we see that as Jesus is giving them the eternal life, the shepherd is giving them eternal life. He does it through a sacrifice. And that sacrifice was what we celebrated a few weeks ago, the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. John chapter 10, verses 14 through 18 says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own sheep, and they know me. And just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, too, that are not in this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life, so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily, for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again, for this is what my Father has commanded. How do we uh, experience eternal life? Because the shepherd 
gives it to us because the shepherd has the opportunity to, to give it to us because of a sacrifice that he's made. So we go through a little bit uh, of the idea of election in this passage. We go through a great deal of the idea of the good news, the gospel in this passage. And then we come to this. We come to a point where the question is, why can't we lose it? You say, why can't we lose what? And the, the idea here is, why can't we lose our salvation? Or why can't we lose uh, the, this eternal life that the shepherd has provided for us? And so as we go through, we see in this passage, the first of all, that it was a gift. It was something that the shepherd has given to his sheep. Now, when we look at gifts, we, we get this idea, when I give a gift to someone, uh, at least when I do it with the right intentions, I give it to them and it's theirs. They can go and they can do with whatever they like and, and I never take it back. And I'm human. Uh, there might be times when I give my son something and, and, and I'm like, man, that was such a cool toy. Uh, and you know, hey, this is yours. But then later on, I kind of take it. But that shows that I'm human. Jesus, the good shepherd, doesn't give you something with the intention or even the idea that he's ever going to have to take it back. He's giving it to you completely and freely of his own will, and he has no intention of giving it back. What a gift means is we didn't do anything to earn it, and I've learned this from, from a young age uh, way back in Camp Carmel, and, and what the pastor told us that week is if you didn't do anything to earn it, what makes you think you can do something to lose it? What makes you think that you can do something to lose it? And, and, and I hear this all the time. Well, because I could decide differently. My suggestion is that if you think you can decide differently, then you may not have been one of Jesus' sheep to begin with. Because when I heard his voice, there is no denying whatsoever, whatsoever that he has called me. And when I decided to follow him, there have been times when I've sinned, there have been times when I've messed up, but every time I've sinned and every time I've messed up, the Holy Spirit living inside of me has convicted me and has brought me back. And you say, well, but I, I'm not listening. I'm not coming back. Well, there's one of two things. Either you are willfully sinning against God and you're still in that act of rebellion. There is still an opportunity for you to confess, repent, and come back. There's still an opportunity for you to repent and come back. You didn't do anything to earn your salvation, your eternal life. You don't do anything to lose it. Well, how do we know? Because the scripture here tells us that God is more powerful than anyone. More powerful than anyone. And in Corinthians, it tells us what can separate us from the love of God. And the answer boils down and boils down and boils down to nothing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Why? Because nothing is more powerful than God. And it's not you and it's not someone else's faith that is holding you, but it's God's power that is holding you. It's God's relationship. It's God's power. It's God's being who is holding you and keeping you. And this is the last reason. Why can't we lose it? Because the shepherd just simply won't allow it. He just simply won't allow it. The shepherd here, described in John chapter 10, we see that he makes promises, and he always keeps his promises. We see that he protects, and we see that he always protects. We see that he's more powerful than all the powers, this world, and even you. And, and how do we understand that? Because Jesus is describing himself as the shepherd. And what he tells us in the last verse of today's passage is, the Father and I are one. Now, he's not necessarily saying that they're the same person, because this is, again, what Ford was talking about last week, about the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are, in essence, God. Now, they are not each individually. Like, God is not Jesus. The Father is not Jesus. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. They're all three God, but they all have different essence. They all have different uh, responsibilities. They all have a different a function within the Godhead. They are all God. And Jesus is not saying that I am the same person that my father is. But what Jesus is saying right here, Ford alluded to it last time, is that the father and I are unified in what we think and how we're bringing this about. So the shepherd and the father agree that if you are my sheep, you hear my voice. If you are my sheep, I know who you are. If you are my sheep, you will follow me. So we don't have to wonder who the Messiah is. 
We don't have to wonder who the Christ is because the Holy Spirit reveals that to us when we are his sheep and we hear his voice. Do you belong to God this morning? Do you belong to the shepherd? Do you understand that he loves you, that he's calling to you, and he's made it possible for you to be his? If you want to be his this morning, it's as simple as this. Turn from your sins and believe that Jesus died for those sins and that he offers forgiveness through faith in him and through him alone. Heavenly Father, we thank you, uh, God, for Jesus. We thank you that he is the good shepherd. We thank you, God, that he has called us by name. And we may not understand how all of it works, but God, when we heard his voice, we responded through faith. We responded by believing. God, I believe that there are some here this morning in this church, God, some that are watching uh, from wherever they are, their living rooms, their cars, their workplace. And God, they're beginning, if they, if they haven't heard it already, they're beginning to hear the voice of the Messiah. They're beginning to hear the voice of the Good Shepherd. They're re- beginning to hear the voice of Jesus calling them by name and asking them, turn from your sins. Put your faith in me. Admit that you've sinned. Ask and take advantage of my forgiveness and come follow me. God, if they hear his voice this morning, I pray that they would respond just simply by saying, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. But God, once they do that, I pray that you would help them to connect with someone who who loves Jesus, connect with with us here at Mount Moriah, connect with a a person who who introduced them to to Mount Moriah or invited them to Mount Moriah so that, that God, they might be able to be introduced to you in a way that, uh, in a way, God, that you desire. Uh, We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.